So around 2,000 years ago, uh, Julius Caesar and his naval armada set out to conquer England. Um, England was a great distance from Rome, and uh, the Celts were actually a really aggressive and skillful army. Uh, the Roman ships had a finite number of soldiers, yet there were hundreds of thousands of the enemy that were represented in this fight. Um, in addition to that, if Caesar and his men planned to retreat, they would actually have to sail back across the channel, which would cut them off from resources and supplies and everything that they needed. And so as the Roman ships were sailing towards England, as they were getting near to the coast, they could literally see the enemy lining up on the cliffs of Dover, eagerly awaiting battle. Now Caesar is said to have directed the ships away from the cliffs, and after a very valiant effort, he was actually able to get them to land safely, but the only problem was that, is that they were surrounded by Celtic soldiers. As the legend goes, Caesar then makes an incredibly daring move. Uh, he knew that his men were tired and he questioned their commitment and resolve. And so what he did next was gangster. See, because he knew it so long as the, the Roman ships stood there on the coast that there would be thought of retreat. And so Caesar demanded that the ships be burned. That way there was no escape, no retreat. If the Roman soldiers were going to be pushed back, they'd be pushed back into the sea, which is to say that if they're going to be pushed back, they were going to perish. He wanted it in the mind of every single person in his army that they had to be committed, that that failure was not an option. They had come to conquer and stay. Today we begin a new series that uh, has been like fire in our bones as we've been dreaming and praying and thinking about all that God has for us as a church uh, this year and beyond. Um, and uh, we're, we're calling this, this series Build the Hearth. All right, Build the Hearth. This is a series about that which we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. It's about stewarding God's intimate presence. Right? We don't just want God to come. Right? We want God to dwell richly among us and in us, amen? We want God to stay. We want him to stay. Now, what is a hearth? Thanks for asking, let me tell you. All right. What is a hearth? Um, a hearth is the prepared ground on which a fire is contained. A, a hearth must first be built if you are going to light a fire and host a flame. To say it another way, you must first build hearths before, uh, before you can properly behold flames. And one thing that I discovered as I uh, was researching her, so I was looking this up, uh, one thing I discovered is that the best material to use, uh, if you're going to build a hearth, the best material to use, believe it or not, are rocks. All right. And so that just begs a question for me. I've been asking myself this, and I'll pose it to you. Could it be that God has it in his heart to use the rock of Roseville as the prepared ground to host his purifying presence and power. Could it be? Could it be? Right. Fire is a reoccurring theme throughout the Bible. It appears about 500 different times in various contexts. And throughout this series, we're going to be looking at famous fires that occur within biblical narratives. And the intent is for us to see all that it reveals about God. And we also want to see what fire exposes in us. All right. Because as we look at these stories, you will see the character of God revealed, right? But that's not all you need to be able to steward the presence of God, right? We need to be willing to look at ourselves, right? We have to be willing to look at ourselves. We have to, to be open to God's desire to purify and refine and transform us, amen? So if we're going to be a community that builds the hearth and stewards the flame, we will need to be like Caesar, who burned his ships, knowing that our greatest enemy is often our own lack of faith. As we, as we want to retreat and run away from all that God brings before us, that's hard. Amen. So we're going to look at two passages today. So 1 Kings 19, 
uh, and later we'll look at uh, 2 Kings 2. So these passages are the bookends of a relationship between Elijah and Elisha. And in this story, we see Elisha being called to, by God to secede Elijah as a prophet. Now, you're going to have to hang with me. There's going to be a lot of Elisha and Elijah today. You're going to have to listen close. All right. But 1 Kings 19 may be familiar to you because it's the famous chapter where Elijah f- flees to Horeb, right? Uh, right after his victory over uh, the prophets of, of Baal, um, he runs away because Jezebel threatens his life, and he goes to, to Mount, Carmel, Mount Carmel. And the Lord appears to Elijah, and he gives him these instructions, all right? And this is what I want to camp on. He gives him these instructions that start in verse 15 of First Kings 19. He says, go back the way you came. This is God speaking to Elijah. Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Haziel, king over Aram, also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mahola, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Haziel, and Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. All right, so from this passage, um, I think we can see three things. All right, we can see three things. We will see who God calls. We will see the cost of the call and the power for the call. All right, we'll see who God calls, the cost of the call, and the power for the call. You guys ready for this? All right, so first, uh, who does God call? Now, when we think of calling, Um, it's hard to see this idea of calling as something that God will be asking us to do that's not in the church, right? Like, don't we think that way? Like, when we think of calling, we're like, okay, what does God want me to do on Sundays, right? That's how a lot of us think, right? But it's it's way more important than that uh, when you think of calling. It's it's actually important to note that most ministry, if it's going to be effective, must actually be done outside the church, right? God tells Elijah to anoint Elisha to be the next prophet of Israel, sure, but he also tells him to anoint a secular king uh, and to anoint the next king of Israel, right? And so there are those of us that are called to minister in the church, 